Hello, and welcome to XR 101. In this video, we're going to take an important step forward from some of the other videos that deal primarily with the fundamental nuts and bolts of virtual reality design, moving on from asking how do you develop VR to how do you develop good VR. To make sense of what it is that distinguishes any old virtual reality experience from a good virtual reality experience, this video will explore several key user experience or UX issues that are particularly relevant to the design of a VR experience. These terms are engagement, immersion, and presence. So what are we talking about when we say UX and how is it relevant to virtual reality design? User experience, like many things, has various definitions and ways of understanding and applying it. In simple terms, UX describes the interaction between an end user and something. That something could be a product, a service, a company, or it could be another person. UX is often tied very closely to the concept of usability. Again, definitions can get messy, and for some people there is quite a significant overlap between usability and user experience. To keep things clear though, it is a good idea to differentiate between the two. Definitions which do so tend to define usability as the more objective aspects of an interaction. Does the product or service work as advertised? Does it work as I expected it to? Is it easy to operate effectively? And so on. By contrast, user experience describes the more subjective aspects of interaction. It covers the quality of an interaction, whilst usability is more concerned with functionality. UX asks how an interaction feels, whilst usability asks if it works. User experience is a research discipline in its own right, and it has effectively become its own industry. As interaction is relevant to every product and service out there, for a company to be confident what they're selling will yield a positive experience for the user is very good for business. As a result, UX is an increasingly huge academic field with an array of different theories, not all of which are relevant to every product or service. Virtual reality design absolutely benefits from UX insights, but there is a subset of UX theories that have been found to be more useful to VR design, and we'll cover some of these here. We'll start with that term so often used when talking about virtual reality, immersion. Immersion is arguably a bit of a buzzword in virtual reality. The most widely accepted definition of immersion is the experience of being completely enveloped in something. That could be anything from water to music, but the key feature of immersion is that in surrounding the user, it obscures them from anything else. This draws a close connection between immersion and head-mounted displays, particularly those with integrated headphones. Their design is such that they almost completely obscure light and sound waves from the real world, leaving the user unable to attend to anything other than the virtual audio and the virtual visuals. All too often, however, immersion is used generically as synonymous for good. Now, admittedly, one key feature and potential value of a head-mounted display is immersion. So if immersion is useful for a particular task or problem, then this supports the use of VR. However, this tells us nothing about how to make good VR, since all head-mounted display VR is to a certain extent immersive, and it's probably not a sensible assertion that all VR is good VR. We need to be careful to only use immersion as a justification for using virtual reality technology in the first place and not conflating it with certain design approaches and then arguing that a particular approach makes the experience better because it's more immersive. This conflation of ideas brings us to the UX matter that is so often confused with immersion. Presence. The idea of presence far predates virtual reality technology and is broadly associated with writings on state of mind. Presence as a psychological experience is defined as feeling a sense of connection with a particular space. To feel present is to feel that yourself your sense of being is somewhere. In reality, as opposed to virtual reality, feeling present largely describes the feeling of having a strong sense of connection to the here and now, akin to the old saying of being in the moment. You could be present in space and time. Presence would be likened to having a detailed, immediate, and often multi-sensory sense of your surroundings. Effectively, it is the opposite of things such as daydreaming, imagining, or letting your mind wander. To be present means your focus is fully on what you are experiencing via your senses. To feel present in virtual reality is essentially the same experience, save for the point that your feeling of presence is not within the physical or real world, but rather in the virtual world. 
Alison McMahon neatly sums up virtual presence as the user's artificial sense that they are experiencing a world without any technological mediation. This points to how VR is often portrayed in fiction, as a total immersion, artificial reality, totally indistinguishable from the real world. Here the purpose of presence in VR is to draw the user in to such an extent that their entire cognitive and emotional awareness is upon the virtual world and its content within, almost as if it were real, losing any sense that what they are interacting with is artificial, or that they're wearing a headset at all, or that they're holding a controller. The technology effectively becomes invisible. Whilst this gives us some idea of how important Presence is to good VR, it offers little in the way of guidance for actually implementing it. Presence as a research topic has been explored to a pretty great extent, but one particular concept that is worth understanding is Jarvanen's Wheel of Presence. The wheel separates Presence into four discrete categories – active, embodied, emotional, and social. Active and embodied presence both mean to have a sense of physical connection to the virtual world, but they go about this connection in different ways. Active presence describes often quite demanding physical actions that can have effects similar to aerobic exercise. VR experiences that evoke active presence may ask the user to perform frequent hitting, throwing or swinging actions that require balance and coordination of the limbs but they may equally employ emotion-driven tactics, such as horror game features and qualities that raise the heart rate and make the user sweat. Embodied presence typically describes the use of more naturalistic interactions that require movement and control of the physical body in more meaningful ways. A meaningful embodied interaction should give the user a sense of their own body, say their height, their weight, or their proportions through actions that require spatial reasoning, muscle tension, or stretching. Consider how a typical video game would have you open a door via a simple button press. Then consider how a VR game could require you to reach your arm out to a door handle, squeeze the controller to grip the handle, rotate your arm and bend your wrist to turn the handle, then bring your hand and arm towards or away from your body to swing the door open. The level of naturalistic physical interaction contributes significantly to presence, and you will find that VR experiences that utilize more of these forms of natural interaction are far more likely to be well received. Social presence is largely about communication and expression. Does your game require the user to interact with other avatars, either human or artificial, on an emotional level? Do they have to, say, interpret facial expression or vocal tone, as in L.A. Noir? Do they have the ability to customise their avatar's appearance or mannerisms in a way that reflects their personality, such as Rec Room? Do any tasks within the experience require coordinated teamwork with others, such as Star Trek Bridge Crew? Although in this particular model it is often grouped with social presence, cognitive presence is arguably a form in its own right. This form of presence is more concerned with feeling a cognitive connection to the virtual world, and can be evoked with engaging puzzles, complex narratives, tasks that require sequential reasoning, pattern matching, or logical deduction. VR games such as the Talos Principle or The Room VR are good examples of this approach to presence. The final section of this model of presence is entitled Emotional Presence, and it deals with what most people with experience of video games think of when they consider factors that draw the player into the game. An engaging narrative, interesting and relatable characters, a novel plot, exciting settings, convincing and natural sounding dialogue, fascinating backstory or lore, generally well-crafted content, all these things contribute to world building and the user perceiving the virtual world as meaningful and somewhere in which they would actually like to be present. Emotional presence is very descriptive of a much broader sense of experiential quality and as such overlaps quite heavily with our next and final user experience topic, engagement. Engagement is often conflated with another UX concept, fun. However, although there is some overlap between the two, engagement is actually a much more wide-ranging concept that incorporates experiential qualities such as challenge, aesthetic, sensory appeal, feedback, kinesthetics and embodiment, novelty, user awareness, motivation and relatability. Most of these qualities are not mutually exclusive or context dependent, meaning if you're hoping to create an engaging VR experience there is no reason why the specifics of your project should stop you from aiming to meet all of these qualities, to give yourself the best chance of creating an engaging experience. 
Is your experience difficult enough to feel satisfying when complete, without being so difficult that it causes rage quit? Does your experience evoke a particular aesthetic or design style your user is likely to find desirable? Is your experience fundamentally appealing to the senses? Does it use an interesting colour palette, eye-catching artwork or imagery? Does it have an interesting soundtrack? Does the setup or introduction encourage the user to continue and ideally complete your experience? Because engagement deals with the quality of an experience, one of the best ways to get a full understanding of the concept is to experience as much good virtual reality as possible. Of course, quality is also highly subjective, so any best VR experience lists that you find online might not necessarily reflect an approach to engagement that perfectly matches your own project, and I'm certainly not going to put my own list here. I will though briefly point to a couple of titles that I think exemplify some of the routes to engagement that we listed a moment ago. Starting with Challenge, consider a game such as Beat Saber, a game that provides a very accessible point of entry for complete beginners and a very simple rule set of hit blocks with your sabers in the correct direction. But it offers a range of difficulty settings in tandem with levels that are naturally more difficult based on the rhythmic composition of the track that determines the spawning of the blocks. Challenge also brings us to another UX term that is worth mentioning in brief here, the concept of flow. Flow can be simply thought of as a sweet spot between challenge and skill. If the challenge far exceeds the skill, the user may feel the task is insurmountable and quit. If the user's skill far exceeds the challenge, the user may feel bored. Flow in a VR experience, particularly a game or a learning type program, means having a difficulty curve that closely aligns with the user's increasing ability. The ways in which the VR experience introduces new challenges, offers instruction, accommodates for failure, clarifies goals and objectives, provides feedback, all tie into flow. The target sensation of flow can be best illustrated in games such as Beat Saber, at points in which the player has practiced the interactions quite significantly and deals with the challenge not like a beginner who must consciously attend to each block, but like an expert who uses muscle memory for the individual moves and focuses their conscious attention on the longer musical phrases or sections. For a good example of novelty, there's The Invisible Hours, a game that presents an otherwise by-the-numbers whodunit adventure with a genuinely innovative time control mechanic that allows you to pause and replay the action in order to view parallel goings-on. For example, at the start of the game, your first instinct will probably be to stay in the lobby of the mansion as there's plenty of action going on. But what else might be happening elsewhere in the mansion? The time travel mechanic allows you to explore the narrative in a uniquely non-linear sense via the central mechanic, putting a fresh twist on an otherwise classic game formula. Lastly, as a great example of kinesthetics and embodied play, consider Superhot VR. Using the time moves when you move mechanic from the original PC version, Superhot VR evokes a continuous sense of your own body as you carefully contort yourself around in a bid to evade the showers of bullets. Superhot VR arguably plays best when the user thinks three-dimensionally and moves vertically as well as laterally and horizontally. This level of movement is not only far better for effective play, but it engages the legs and feet so that the player is moving with their entire body and not just their arms and head. The effect of this is that the player is constantly aware of their physical body and its movement in reference to the rest of the virtual world, drawing a particularly strong perceptual connection between the two. Before we move on from engagement, one thing you may have spotted is that a couple of qualities are somewhat contradictory, namely novelty and relatability. To be novel, the experience needs to present the user with something that feels new, whilst to be relatable, the experience needs to present the user with something that feels familiar although this is indeed a contradiction. The solution to this design paradox is pretty simple. The VR experience should aim to feel mostly familiar, but with at least one key novel feature. The ratios between the two are definitely debatable, and again, a good project will analyze its stakeholders and its competition to gain insight into balancing novelty with familiarity. But let's take, for example, Half-Life Alex. In Half-Life Alex, the target audience was clearly the existing fan base of the Half-Life franchise. Looking at the game's design, we can see how in many aspects, developers Valve stuck very closely to the aesthetic, the settings, and the narrative themes of Half-Life 2. Enemies largely consist of familiar creatures, and the protagonist of the title, Alex Vance, is a central character in the lore of the Half-Life universe. 
This familiarity was counterbalanced very effectively indeed with various creative and very well executed player interactions that use the inherent features of virtual reality control. Boards need to be physically ripped away with the player's hands to pass through certain doorways. The shooting mechanic rewards precision sharp shooting over bullet spraying to encourage shooting down the sight rather than from the hip. Pickups and wearable items are carefully placed or have functionality that encourages the player to regularly move their upper bodies into different positions, much like Supart VR. And the physics and interaction is also worth a special note. Almost everything can be picked up or moved and responds within the virtual world in a natural, physical way. A running theme of this series has been the importance of considering your VR project in context of all relevant stakeholders, of all your options, be that hardware, design approach and so on, and in the context of the aims and requirements of your project, meaning what you actually want to achieve. Although these are absolutely all very important points to consider, there is a strong argument that at the centre of all of this is the user. As a designer, your priority is to deliver the user a high quality experience, and in this task you have a lot of options. Of course, no one can expect you, or anyone for that matter, to deliver an experience that excels in every single area that we've talked about. Indeed, some of the best VR experiences focus very keenly on a small subset of UX targets and put all their energy into making those aspects as strong as possible. This brings us back to the aims and requirements of your project. The better defined the ambitions of a project are, the better the chance they can be realised by a good designer. Hopefully this has given you a better understanding of some of the core user experience theory as relevant to VR design, and you now have a stronger practical awareness of how you might be able to use some of this theory to make better VR experiences. Thanks for watching.